Okay, um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this next session. Um, today, we're going to be talking about electrochemistry um, in our analytical instrumental chemistry, um, how it can be utilized. We're just going to really be doing the fundamentals today. So some of this may be familiar to you. Um, but anyway, in any case, it'll be a good way to refresh before we move on to um, some of the more complicated things. So we're talking about the fundamentals of electrochemistry. So we'll be considering all things from what is voltage, what is uh, like what are amperes, current, and what is a potential, things like that. The components of a cell, the Nernst equation, and uh, maybe getting on to some um, more detailed things towards the end, like um, the standard potential and things like that. But uh, let's get into it. So electrochemistry is a branch of analytical chemistry that uses electrical measurements of chemical systems for analytical purposes. So this can be really useful in our instrumental chemistry and our analytical chemistry labs um, where we're trying to measure like, for example, um, how much of a particular ionic species there is. Now the classic example is going to be our pH. Um, our pH meters usually make use of electrochemistry um, because the hydrogen ion is charged. It can have a certain potential across a, a cell and um, that potential is directly related to the concentration. So this is very much uh, part and part of our um, instrumental chemistry. So electricity then can be used to drive a chemical reaction. So we won't really look at that so much, except in the sense of um, oxidation and reduction reactions that may be happening at electrodes. Um, beyond that, um, we'll, we'll just be looking at those kind of reactions. Um, and a chemical reaction can be used to produce electricity. So that's the sense of a reaction forming an ion, releasing an electron. And um, okay, so redox reactions. So typically whenever we are dealing with these kind of electrochemistry problems, um, they're involving some sort of electron transfer. Uh, usually it's going from one species which has an abundance of electrons to a species which does not. And usually it's driven by things like um, the number of electrons that are in the valence of that particular element. Um, whether or not it wants to, it has a high electron affinity or it is um, it has a, a low ionization potential. So those sorts of things that you learned way back in general chemistry are starting to come back again here. Um, I mean, we won't talk about them in terms of those, but ultimately that's kind of why this happens. Um, it may seem like those were distant memories, but the basis of uh, those properties is here. So um, redox reactions involve the transfer of electrons from one species to another. Usually um, we have something, some species giving up an electron, usually some sort of metal, uh, but not always. And then um, some species accepting that electron, um, that species really could be anything. So uh, oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is going to be gain of electrons. So I don't know if you've come across this or not, or you've if you've got a better version of this, but I always like to remember, I tell all my classes this when we discuss oxidation reduction, oil rig. Uh, why do I talk about oil rigs whenever I'm talking about redox reactions? Well, oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Oil rig. Um, it doesn't work for everyone, it works for me has done since I was in your position. So um, I still use it. The oxidizing agent takes electrons from the species that is oxidized. So the um, this is kind of a little bit not tricky, but it's just kind of like it, it might not be immediately obvious. But um, to be an oxidizing agent, the species is actually reduced. So it's oxidizing something else and it is taking electrons from that species. And then conversely, the reducing agent gives out electrons and so it itself is oxidized because it is losing, it loses the electrons it gives. So in order to reduce a different species, it itself is going to be reduced. So we have iron three plus and vanadium two plus here and they're reacting to give iron two plus and vanadium three plus. 
Um, so what's happening to the iron three plus is it's gaining an, an electron and going from iron three plus to iron two plus. And the vanadium is being reduced as it is going from, or sorry, it's being oxidized as it is going from vanadium two plus to vanadium three plus. So this is an oxidation because it is losing an electron. Iron is being reduced because it is gaining electrons. It's going from uh, a higher oxidation state to a lower oxidation state. So that means it has gained an electron. So iron three plus is an oxidizing agent. Vanadium two plus is a reducing agent. Uh, chemistry um, and electricity. So we have a number of units here that we need to be familiar with before we go any further a number of definitions. So electric charge is usually given the term Q um, this here, and it has a, a, a unit, uh, SI unit of electrical charge is called a Coulomb, which is big, le big letter C. There's no degree sign here. That's how you know the difference. Um, degree Celsius has a degree, but this does not. This is a Coulomb. Um, so the charge of one electron is given this value. This kind of value would be given to you in a table of data. In our previous quizzes and long tests, you may have seen like a table of data that I've given you. It probably has this on it. You probably didn't know why it was there originally. I just put all of the constants there, that's why. But, um, so it's universal. But this one um, will be there. Um, so that's the charge of one electron. So it's 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, it's not like the speed of light. So it's not like you know something you should really remember. So one mole of electrons is 9.649 times 10 to the four coulombs of charge. What, where did this suddenly come from? It's just this number times Avogadro's constant. Um, and then this uh, mole of electrons is called the Faraday constant. And so the Faraday constant F is equal to 9.649 times 10 to the four coulombs per one mole of electrons. Faraday was like a, physicist who worked a lot in electrochemistry. Um, well, physicist, chemist, at that time it was all kind of blurry. Um, current then is given the letter I, and it is the quantity of charge flowing per second, um, coulombs per second. So the SI unit of current is the ampere. Um, this is given the big letter A, this is amps that you may have heard of before. Um, then electrical potential, which we will be talking about a lot, is given the letter E. And this is the work needed or done when moving electric charge from one point to another. And the SI unit of electric potential is the volt, V. So um, in almost all of the examples that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be working with this electric potential. And the electrical potential is the work needed or done when moving electric charge from one point to another. And it's typically got the unit of volts or millivolts or... Yeah, mostly in our cases, we'll be talking volts and millivolts. So uh, a brief example of how you might calculate the, the work done in a particular cell. Um, it's analogous to sort of water flowing through a hose, um, but uh, it's, it's not the same. So one joule of energy is gained or lost when one coulomb of charge moves between points whose potentials differ by one volt. So the work done by a system in joules is equal to the potential times the, um, the charge. So the potential is in volts, charge is in coulombs. Um, so how do we do a calculation of this type? So how much work is done if 2.4 millimoles of electrons fall through a potential difference of 0 0.27 volts? So the first thing we have to do is convert our moles of electrons into coulombs of charge using this equation here where um, Q is the charge and that's equal to N big N F. So small n here is um, the charge. So it happens to be one for our electrons. Um, like the, the, the minus one on the uh, electron. Um, N is Avogadro's constant, oh, no, N is the number of moles, sorry. And F is um, Faraday constant. So uh, we fill in our values. So we have 2.4 millimoles. So that's 2.4 times 10 to the minus three moles. So we fill that into our equation. So one times 2.4 times 10 to the minus three moles times the Faraday constant, which is here, will give us a value of 2.3 times 10 to the two coulombs. So that is going to be our um, charge, which is flowing um, whenever we move the electrons through a potential difference of 0 0.27 volts. 
So the work then is going to be equal to, or it's going to be calculated using this equation, which was from the previous slide. So work in joules is going to be equal to the potential in volts times uh, the charge in coulombs. We just worked out the charge based on this equation here. Um, and then the work is going to be equal to 0 0.27 volts times 2.3 times 10 to the 2 coulombs, which will give us a value of 62 joules. So a reasonable amount of work has been done um, to move our electrons through that uh, potential difference. And the reason why, like in textbooks, it's sometimes sort of written out that like the movement of electric current is analogous to the volume of water is because like the, the higher the potential difference, so the larger this value, the more work is done. Um, so you get uh, a different flow of water through your hose, the higher up the, um, the water reservoir is, um, just because of gravity, but gravity doesn't cause the electrons to work more um, in electrical circuits. So chemistry and electricity. So the free energy change of a chemical reaction is related to the voltage that can be generated by the reaction. So um, the delta G, so this is the free energy change, is equal to the negative value for the work, which is equal to minus EQ, E being the potential, Q being the charge, which we can replace then with minus um, N F E. So um, this is N is the uh, charge on the species. So this can like this equation doesn't just apply to electrons. It can also apply to other charged species. Um, so long as they're moving through um, our system, and then F is the Faraday constant, and E is the potential. Ohm's law. Then, so the current is directly proportional to the potential difference. Um, across the circuit and inversely proportional to the resistance R across the circuit. So I um, current is equal to E over R, E being the potential, R being the resistance. And so the unit of resistance is ohm, uh, given the Greek letter ohm um, here. So basically the current um, changes as is inversely proportional to the um, the resistance. So as the resistance increases, the current decreases with um, static uh, potential. So like, for example, if the resistance is four and uh, the current is one, so it'll be one over four. Ooh. And then if we increase the resistance, the current would reduce. So if we did one over eight, that kind of thing. So if the, if the potential stays the same, but the resistance changes, we reduce the amount of current which goes through the circuit. Power P is the work done per unit time. So P is equal to the work over um, S. We already worked out what work was, um, which was given to us earlier uh, in joules as the potential times the charge of the system. Um, and then that's all over seconds to show us the power, which is the work done per unit time. And so E can then, so we can sort of extract out E here as being the potential times Q over S where Q is the um, charge and S is the unit of time. So the SI unit of power is joules per second, but it is better known by its non-ASI term, which is the watt. You may have heard of wattage and so on, and things like bulbs, light bulbs and what have you. Okay, so let's do a sample calculation. In a circuit, a battery generates a potential difference of three volts. A resistor has a resistance of 100 ohm. The wire has negligible resistance, so that's important because sometimes like the wire has intrinsic resistance. What is the current and power of the battery? So we're going to have to work out what the current is. We're going to have to work out what the power is. So the current, remember, is going to be the potential divided by the um, resistance. So we already worked that out, like as resistance increases, then the current decreases. Um, but as the um, potential increases, the current increases. And then the power is going to be how much um, energy, basically, this um, battery can provide per second. 
uh, and then the wires has negligible resistance. So the current then is going to be I is equal to E over R, E being the potential, R being the resistance. So 3.0 volts over 100 ohms gives us 0 0.030 amps, which we can convert to 30 milliamps. Um, so we just literally got the values from the table, three volts, 100 ohms, stuck them into the equation. Um, this is the standard form of this equation. And then that's going to be equal to 0 0.030 amps, which we can then make equal to 30 milliamps. And then the power from the battery is given as such. So the power is going to be equal to the, um, the potential times the current. So uh, we have the potential is three, the current is 0 0.030 amps. And so we end up with 90 milliwatts um, as our um, power. So uh, a galvanic cell, so this is um, the basis of most regular disposable batteries are galvanic cells, um, sometimes called voltaic cells, although we'll mostly call them galvanic cells. And they use some sort of spontaneous chemical reaction to generate electrical energy. Um, so the delta G value is going to be less than zero because it's going to be an exothermic reaction. It's going to release energy pretty easily. Um, so batteries, as I said, are galvanic cells. Um, so like a silver or cadmium battery, which is a pretty common battery, at least before, um, operates like this. So there are reduction reactions and oxidation reactions. There's some sort of electron transfer process, and that's what's going to be used to drive our uh, energy production from our battery. So there's going to be a reduction reaction where some species is going to gain electrons, so in that case, it's our silver chloride and it's going to gain two electrons and it's going to be um, reduced to form silver metal and a chloride. Um, well, the chloride is not going to do anything. It's just going to stay in solution. And then um, oxidation reaction is going to be the cadmium is going to be solid and then it's going to form cadmium two plus. And this is going to be the source of the electrons for our silver chloride. Then uh, the net overall reaction is cadmium uh, and silver chloride react to give cadmium two plus plus two um, silvers plus two chloride ions in solution. So uh, these things are not always necessarily combined together. Um, usually they're in separate regions of the battery um, and they only um, transfer the electrons um, whenever it's required. Now the one of the reasons why batteries run out of power is eventually it gets to the point where there is no more uh, reaction. Um, it reaches an equilibrium state and um, it, the reaction just doesn't proceed anymore to produce the electrons which are necessary to carry the potential through the battery and then out to whatever device we need to use. So um, this is on the right hand side here we have a galvanic cell, um, something you might see in the chemistry lab. Um, you probably wouldn't see it in uh, normal uh, situations. Um, it's a bit too big, um, but this is, this is kind of the basis of uh, those batteries, those disposable batteries. They're just like optimized to a really high extent and uh, minimized into a small package, um, which is easy for us to use. Um, but ultimately this is just a blown up version, like a bigger version of the, the whole process. So uh, we have here, two electrodes, um, one which is going to be a negative electrode and one which is going to be a positive electrode. So one is going to be a source of electrons and the other is going to be a, it's going to remove electrons basically. So um, here in the cathode, we have a net overall reaction where the silver in solution is attracted towards this negatively charged silver metal, um, which is a source of electrons. And so what happens is the silver in solution it's deposited over time onto this um, silver uh, piece of metal here. And so this, you, you can actually watch this over time, like silver will deposit here. It will get thicker, noticeably thicker. Sometimes depending on the metal involved um, that's being deposited, it may deposit as kind of like uh, spikes or something like that. But usually it deposits as a very um, smooth surface. And this is very important actually for um, 
applications in the industry like uh, electroplating. Um, so it's one of the best ways actually to um, coat something in metal, which is a uniform coating. So um, usually you put like um, your item, whatever it happens to be, so long as it conducts the electricity inside of a solution filled with the metal ions that you want. And then by applying a particular voltage, you can actually deposit metal onto the surface of that object. But anyway, that's that's for a different a different day. Um, so in this cell, we have um, the silver ions being consumed to uh, produce uh, silver metal that removes electrons from the um, solution. So we then have um, an anode here where the reaction is the cadmium is being consumed to produce electrons which flow through the circuit to the silver, which is where the silver will actually um, get the electrons from. So the electrons have to come from somewhere in our circuit. The electrons come from the cadmium, which is going to be depleted over time. So whereas this silver metal, we will see it get bigger because the silver from solution will deposit onto the surface here. What will happen is that um, cadmium, solid cadmium will dissolve into solution in order to release those electrons through our cell that can eventually come to the silver and be used for this um, reduction reaction here. And then these two cells need to be connected because uh, I don't know how much you know about electrical circuits, but electrical circuits have to be complete. And if they're not completed, then they won't be able to properly pass the charge. And if they're not able to properly pass the charge, then we won't see any activity. So how are they connected? They're connected by this thing called a salt bridge. Um, the salt bridge is filled with an electrolyte solution. Um, usually um, it's based on the ions, the counter ions in this solution. So for example, here we have um, silver nitrate, here we have cadmium nitrate, this NO3, that's nitrate. Um, so the salt bridge will contain nitrate ions. Um, then it'll also have some sort of counter ion, in this case it's potassium. And so what happens is that the potassium flows towards the um, cathode because um, as the silver is deposited here, we're losing those positive ions. So silver was kind of maintaining the charge balance between the nitrate and the silver. Um, the nitrate being negatively charged, the silver being positively charged. So the potassium flows through the salt bridge and um, out into this solution so that for every silver ion that gets deposited here, a potassium ion comes out. So the charge remains balanced. Um, and then the opposite direction, um, for every cadmium, neutral cadmium, which is dissolved into solution, which forms this cadmium two plus, we need to have two nitrate ions coming out of the salt bridge to form um, a more neutral, uh, to maintain neutrality, sorry. Okay, so uh, as well as that, like the cadmium ions can flow through to this side as well. If, if, uh, if that were to happen, that's possible. Um, so the electrode at which reduction occurs is called the cathode, and the electrode at which oxidation occurs is called the anode. The salt bridge separates the two half cells and maintains electroneutrality throughout the cell. Anions flow to the anode and cathodes flow to the cathode. So that's kind of just a, a quick summary of what I explained there. So um, we can use our line notation uh, as a simpler way. Rather than drawing out this diagram in the bottom right, um, we can use uh, what's called electrochemical cell line notation. So this is a way of describing electrochemical cells um, by employing some um, symbols, these pipe symbols. So um, we have this symbol here. Um, whenever it's just one of them is there, it's called a phase boundary. And whenever there are two of them beside each other, that's a salt bridge. So the salt bridge is this thing in the middle. So it will separate our anode and our cathode. So typically it's written from uh, left to right, from anode to cathode. So the electrode here is going to be cadmium. It's usually on the, the ones on the outside, like here and here are the electrodes typically. So there's a cadmium electrode and then in solution, like because there's a phase change here um, indicated by this single line, um, we have then cadmium nitrate in solution. Then we have a double line here, which is our salt bridge. 
And then we have our uh, in solution species, which is our silver nitrate. And then we have our electrode, which is silver. And that is separated by, again, by a phase boundary. Phase boundary, because this is in solution, this is aqueous, and this is solid. So standard potentials. So the voltage tells us how much work can be done by electrons flowing from one side to the other. Um, so usually, like, there is a, there's a, a known set of, of potentials, um, voltages, which um, are known for, the, like, a lot of common ions, like, you know, basic ions like silver plus, um, cadmium 2 plus, calcium 2 plus, um, sodium plus, things like that. So the potentiometer or voltmeter shows a positive voltage when the electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. If the electrons flow from the other way, it shows a negative voltage. So the voltmeter shows a positive voltage um, if the electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. Um, and then if it's the other way, then it's going to be a negative charge. So that's if it's going from the cathode to the um, anode. So all half reactions are generally written as reductions. So this is the gain of electrons. So even if it happens to be actually an oxidation reaction, um, the convention is to write everything as a reduction, um, especially when writing out the standard potentials for these things. So just be bear that in mind. You still just, just because you're given two half reactions, which are both reductions, doesn't mean that that doesn't properly describe an electrochemical cell. Because remember, all of these are equilibria and so they can be reversed. So each half reaction is assigned a standard reduction potential E0, uh, this E circle, which is the standard reduction potential, where standard means that the activities of all species are unity. So what does that mean? So there are chemical, there's a thing called chemical activity, which kind of describes how much something um, is basically how much how active it is like is it active 100 percent of the time is it active 50 percent of the time and so it's given as like a fraction of like of one so it's like 0 0.5 or from zero to one basically so one indicates perfect um, activity and that all species are active are active all of the time standard potentials then so the potentiometer measures the difference in potential of the half cell of interest attached to the positive terminal and the potential of the standard hydrogen electrode attached to the negative terminal. So um, there should be an L here. So this is um, one of the ways in which we measure the potential of different species. So we attach an unknown species, in this case, the silver plus, uh, the silver solution, uh, which we don't know the reduction potential of. And we um, attach it to something called a standard electrode and so the standard electrode has very well known behavior and it has a very well known um, potential and that means that we can measure other things relative to it so in this sense um, it's just our it's kind of just our reference material like it's something that we know the behavior of when we can like work out the unknown based on it So the, the overall potential of the system is going to be equal to the, um, the potential, which we read up here. It's going to be the total potential. And that's going to be the combination of the positive um, and the negative um, potentials. So the positive potential is the one at the anode. And the negative potential, in this case, happens to be the one at the cathode. So we then need to plug those into our um, system. So, oh, hang on, I'll explain this a little bit more. Um, so one, of, well, okay. The hydrogen, um, standard hydrogen electrode requires a, con a steady constant flow of hydrogen gas, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to use, but it's very, very accurate. Um, it's very, very useful because it uses platinum, which is not very reactive. So, the hydrogen gas is pumped through and it's used um, in our standard hydrogen electrode um, where the electrode is the platinum metal um, and so the hydrogen gas is going to be um, oxidized to produce the H plus ions in solution. Um, you'll see this like kind of weird looking A 
and then a subscript with the species like H2 here or H plus or silver plus here. That's the um, activity. So the activity um, needs to be one at the standard, at, at standard potentials, the activity is always equal to one. So sometimes you'll see it written, oftentimes it's omitted because it's already understood that their activity is unity. And the rest is just kind of standard, the salt bridge and solution on the other side. This salt bridge will have, of course, an electrolyte in it, which will help to balance the charges. So the standard hydrogen electrode, so this is the um, reduction potential for that. Even though what's actually happening is an oxidation, we always write standard potentials as reductions. So what's happening here is um, H plus um, with an activity of one in the aqueous phase is gaining electron to produce half of a mole, half of, a mole of um, hydrogen gas, which also has an activity of one because at the standard potential, all the activities are one. So potential of zero volts is arbitrarily assigned to the standard hydrogen electrode at 25 degrees Celsius. So this zero volts is not actually accurate, but we set the value for that um, standard hydrogen electrode as being zero, just so that it's easier to measure other things against it. If this is going to be zero, then everything else is going to be whatever value we read on the potentiometer. So if I go back quickly, so this is going to be the value for the silver um, cell here, which is going to be our cathode. So um, the value there is plus 0 0.799 volts for that reduction potential. So the standard hydrogen electrode is used as a reference point to measure other half cell potentials. And uh, the standard um, potential is measured for the reaction of the reduction of silver plus to silver solid is plus 0 0.799 volts, which means that we have a flow of electrons from the anode to the cathode. Uh, yeah, so a positive voltage means that electrons flow from the platinum to the silver um, plus. So here are some standard um, reduction potentials, um, just to give you an idea and how to sort of look at the relationship between them. So, um, we have here, um, they're all written as reductions um, because the, that's just the standard way of doing it so that we have a, a standard method of comparing these things so it's easier for everyone to talk in the same language. So we have the oxidizing agent here, which is going to gain electrons, um, and then that's going to be reduced to form um, the species on the other side. So uh, we have here some which have very high oxidizing power, um, so they really want to gain electrons. And so they will have very positive um, potentials. Then down at the bottom, we have those which have very high reducing power. So they want to um, lose an electron. They want to give an electron. They want to be oxidized. So the oxidizing power, so I mean, okay, it's not that, um, it should hopefully, eventually after this slide, it shouldn't hopefully be too complicated. Um, because if we look at the species that are involved here, um, those which are, highly reducing and those which are highly oxidizing, it kind of makes sense if we think about like their ionization potentials and we think about their electron affinities back from gen camp, like, you know, it kind of makes sense that they behave in this way. Like if we look at uh, fluorine, fluorine is a halogen in group seven. So it has seven electrons in its valence. Um, if it gains another electron, it has a full valence. So the idea that it really wants to get more electrons, i.e. it wants to be um, reduced, is, 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 is pretty straightforward, or like it seems pretty reasonable. Um, it would be a good oxidizing agent, good at removing electrons from other things. And then if we look at things like lithium or potassium, um, those are um, in group one, um, of the periodic table. They have a lot of um, desire to lose an electron so that they can have a full valence as well. So it kind of makes sense that they want to lose that electron, that they want to reduce something else that they themselves want to be oxidized. And so it, it kind of makes sense. Like it's, it's um, the, the, the voltage or the potential um, here for the reduction is, is negative because it's, it's pretty hard to do. Um, whereas the um, the potential standard potential here for um, 
fluorine is is positive because it's um, pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy to give fluorine electrons. Okay, so um, that was looking at the basic components of a cell, looking at um, cathode anode reactions, talking about like the um, standard way of writing these things, which is always as a reduction potential. And then like looking at some species which were common reducing agents or common oxidizing agents. So now I will move on to something um, a little bit more um, instrumental chemistry. Um, and we'll be talking about the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation uh, includes two terms, one for the driving force for the redox reaction under standard conditions, and one that shows dependence on reagent concentrations. So one term shows what is happening in our cell that actually causes us to have the redox reaction. Um, and the other shows us how the concentration of the species present actually changes our potential. So um, yeah, so one is like, one is like the strength of the reaction based on how many moles of a species are present. Um, and the other is taking into account how much of that species is actually present. So for the half uh, reaction here where we have A, A, so A of A plus N electrons produced gives us B of B. So that is going to be a reduction reaction because it is gaining electrons. Um, it, this has some charge. This has some charge as well. The Nernst equation for this is going to be this. So um, the potential that we actually observe on our potentiometer is going to be equal to the standard potential under standard conditions. So that's going to be like the, the idealized version of how much driving force there is for the redox reaction, minus this term, which takes into account the concentrations of the different species. Um, there are a number of ways of writing this. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. So. The first part here is really just a constant. R is the universal gas constant. T is the temperature. N is the charge of the species. Uh, usually it's an electron, so usually it's one. And F is the Faraday constant, which is the, um, the amount of charge per mole. And then um, this is going to be the natural log of the activities of the two species, so the product over the reactant. This is like our reaction quotient from equilibrium, if you recall um, your equilibrium stuff um, from before. So products of reactants. Um, this is activity though, but you can write it as concentration. There is a version which uses concentrations instead. And be careful, this is the natural log and not log to the base 10. And so the half a reaction in the Nernst equation is the reaction quotient Q, which is equal to products of reactants, which is the activity of product B to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient of B um, over the um, activity of species A to the power of the um, stoichiometric coefficient of A. So uh, explaining all of the terms in the Nernst equation. So E is equal to um, the standard potential uh, minus this term here, but this is a constant. And this is uh, taking into account the actual activity or concentration of species present. So the standard reduction potential um, is going to happen whenever the activities of A and B are unity, but they're not always unity. Um, but the standard reduction potential, um, this part takes that into account. Then R is going to be the gas constant, T is going to be the temperature, N is the number of electrons in the half reaction, and F is the Faraday constant, which is this, and AI is the activity of species I. So um, the Nernst equation is per um, electrode. So we have we in our cell, if we recall, that the total um, equation which describes the potential for our cell is equal to um, the difference of the uh, positive and the negative cells. So we're going to have a Nernst equation for both of these electrodes, uh, or both of these half cells. We're going to have one for the, um, the positive and one for the negative, the cathode. So one for the anode, one for the cathode. Um, we can, of course, convert into the base 10 logarithm. And if we assume that the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298.15 degrees Kelvin, this gives the most useful form of the Nernst equation. So this is whenever it's at 25 degrees Celsius. It's not always 25 degrees Celsius um, in the rooms that we operate in. Sometimes it's colder, sometimes it's hotter, just depends where we are. Um, so we would have to change this if the temperature changes. Um, although by and large, most examples that you will see will 
assume that it's 25 degrees Celsius, which is kind of a halfway house between a hot climate and a cold climate. So E is the potential. Um, e, well, actually, we already talked about, these are just the terms. N is the number of electrons in the half cell um, reaction. So uh, as I said a moment ago, the Nernst equation for the complete cell is going to require two Nernst equations, one for the anode and one for the cathode. And here over here, we have the, um, the cell, the galvanic cell that we saw earlier. So the um, anode um, potential is the electrode attached to the positive terminal and the net E minus is the potential of the electrode attached to the negative terminal. So the potential of each half reaction written as a reduction is governed by the Nernst equation. So yeah, so we're going to have to write a Nernst equation for both the anode and the cathode. And then the, the, the value that we get up here on the potentiometer is going to be based on those. So the voltage is of the complete reaction is the difference between the two half reactions. So writing a net cell reaction and finding its voltage. So we write the reduction half reactions for both half cells and find the standard potential for each. Um, so that's the, the reduction half. So yeah, so write it like, you know, silver plus plus an electron, it gives us silver. So we multiply the half reactions so that they contain the same number of electrons. When you multiply a reaction, you do not multiply um, the standard potential. So write a Nernst equation for the right half cell attached to the positive terminal of the potentiometer. This is E plus. Um, write a Nernst equation for the left uh, half cell attached to the negative terminal of the potentiometer. This is E minus. And then find the net cell voltage E is equal to E plus minus E minus. And then write the net cell reaction by subtracting the left half reaction from the right half reaction. So um when we multiply a reaction so okay uh this part here is important um it's a bit tedious sometimes to write out all of these uh reactions but it's a good practice to do so so we want to multiply the half cell reactions so that they contain the same number of electrons so in our previous example um we had silver plus um maybe i'll go back and show you it. there we go so we have our two reactions here we have um silver plus uh plus an electron gives silver, um, and we have cadmium gives cadmium two plus plus two electrons. So um, this would be cadmium two plus plus two electrons gives cadmium in our standard reduction potential, if we were to write it out properly. So like we would have CD um, two plus plus an electron or plus two electrons, sorry is in equilibrium and gives us cadmium, solid cadmium. Okay, there are two electrons here. And then for the reduction potential for the other half cell, we have silver plus, plus an electron is in equilibrium and gives us silver. All right, so in the top half cell, we have two electrons. The bottom half cell, we have one electron. So we need to multiply the bottom half cell by two which is conveniently what they did down here. Um, but we need to do it in our calculations. So multiply everything by two. Um, but the standard potential doesn't change because the standard potential doesn't care how much uh, we multiply the equation by. It's still going to be uh, one silver and one electron give, one silver plus and one electron gives one silver metal. So we don't multiply uh, the standard potential. So um, the standard potential and the equilibrium constant. So galvanic cells produce electricity because they're not at equilibrium and they want to reach equilibrium. We know um, from, well, okay, hopefully you remember from any studies of equilibrium you did before that a system not at equilibrium wants to reach equilibrium. So when a battery reaches zero volts, the chemicals inside have reached equilibrium and the battery is dead. Strictly speaking, there are still species that could produce more power, but because they have reached equilibrium, they have no desire to actually um, re react anymore and produce any more potential. So at this point, uh, the potential is equal to zero and Q is equal to K. So the reaction quotient is equal to the equilibrium constant. And therefore we have um, our standard potential is equal to um, this part of the Nernst equation, which is um, 0 0.05916, 
over n, where n is the number of electrons in the half reaction, um, times the log of k, where k is the equilibrium constant. And so k, we can get k basically from our standard, our, our, yeah, our standard potential. So k is equal to this, just rearranging this. Um, so it's 10 to the power of n uh, standard potential divided by 0 0.0, 0, 0 0.05916 at 25 degrees Celsius, remember. Okay, so let's use the standard potential and our equilibrium constant is the last thing we'll do today. So what is the equilibrium constant for the reaction given below where we have copper um, reacting with um, iron three plus to give iron two plus plus um, copper two plus. Um, so I want you maybe to try and identify which one is the oxidizing species and which one is the reducing species. So which one is going to be oxidized, which species itself is gonna be oxidized and which species itself is gonna be reduced in this reaction. So remember our oil rig. So which species is oxidized, which species is reduced? Oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. Okay, so um, if you said that copper was oxidized, you would be right. Um, and then conversely, iron is going to be reduced. So the copper here is going from copper zero to copper two plus. So it's going from neutral copper to copper two plus. It's losing two electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons. The iron three plus is going from iron three plus to iron two plus, which is gain of electrons. And so iron three plus is going to be reduced. This allows us to be to ensure that we have our redox reaction. Uh, so you split the reaction into two half reactions, like so, sorry. Um, so we have two Fe3 plus plus two uh, electrons gives us two iron two pluses. And then we have copper two plus plus two electrons gives us copper solids. And so these are the um, standard potentials for both of these reductions. And then the net reaction is given here. Remember that um, we always write these as reductions even though this is the reaction happening at the oxidation side, and this is the, the reaction happening at the reduction side, um, but we always write these out as reductions. So like here, this is an oxidation, but we had to reverse it to write it out as the half cell or the half reaction, because that's just the standard way of doing it. Um, so um, the standard potential for the net reaction is gonna be E, uh, the standard potential is going to be equal to the standard potential of the positive uh, minus the standard potential of the negative, which is going to be a 0 0.771 minus 0 0.339, which, you know, which gives us 0 0.432 volts as our standard potential for the net reaction. So then we can compute the uh, equilibrium constant based on the equation we saw on the previous slide by just plugging in the numbers. Um, so uh, K is equal to 10 time 10 to the power of N is times the standard potential divided by this number at 25 degrees Celsius, remember. So that's gonna be equal to 10 uh, to the power of two times 0 0.432 divided by 0 0.05916 gives us four times 10 to the 14 um, as our e equilibrium constant, which shows that the equilibrium lies heavily to the right-hand side. So a high equilibrium constant means that we have um, a lot of movement towards producing products. And so this two number here came from the fact that we have two in our half cells here. So small values of uh, the standard potential can produce large K values. Okay. So yeah, so these can be quite small, but it can produce a large K value. All right, um, that's us for today.